Amen. We are starting the, ser- the, uh, the series today, the seven churches of Revelation. We're going to start in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Chapter 2, we're going to look at the, the first church today, the church of Ephesus. Okay, Ephesus. The, the title of today's sermon is Activity Over Adoration. Activity Over Adoration. Adoration. As you're turning, I want to put up a, a map here. You see, I, w- I wanted to kind of give you a visual understanding of what we're talking about here. You see, this is Asia Minor. This is modern-day Turkey. You see the churches there that are listed, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. These are all real churches of the day. They were churches that had been planted, some of them, by Paul. We see Acts chapter 19, Paul uh, planted the church at Ephesus. Uh, We see that there are other, uh, not on there, there are other churches throughout Turkey here that are not addressed in Revelation. These seven churches, I think, were, were picked, I think, by Jesus as representative of churches in general. We, As we work through these seven churches, we're going to see which church we are. But see, not only is it a, a, an idea of the church in general, but we have to understand that the church is made of people. Okay, the church isn't the building. It's not a location. The church is the people. We are the church, the people of God. And so when we see the message to the churches, we understand that the message is to us. Because you can't, the, the church doesn't have a personality outside of its people. You see, we have the personality. Our church has a personality because of who we are, because we are the people of the church. As we go through these these churches, I, I want us to see some things. I want us to understand where do we fit as a church? Which church would we be? Would we would we be the church of Ephesus? Would we be Theatira? Would we who would we be the church of Laodicea? But even more so, I, I, I think the Lord has something to tell us as a church out of this. And I think the Lord has something to tell each one of us out of this too. Because indeed, we are the church. We are the people of God that he congregates here on, on Sundays and Monday nights and Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights and tonight So, let's go to the Word. We're going to start in chapter 2, the book of Revelation. We're going to look at this, and we're going to see what the Lord was saying. Try to understand what the Lord is saying to the churches. Verse 1, write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, this is Jesus speaking. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands says this, I know your works, your labor, your endurance, that you cannot tolerate evil. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. You also possess endurance and have tolerated many things because of my name and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet, you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, and which I also hate. Verse 7, anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in God's paradise. We begin looking at this, and you, go, you can go back at the end of chapter 1, and uh, Jesus makes it clear that the lampstands that he's walking amongst are the churches, these seven churches of which he's telling us about, the seven churches he is walking amongst. And, and it says that the angels, right, the right hand who holds the seven stars, these are the angels of the churches. Now, I think, 
I don't think we have like our own angel. I think he's talking about messenger there when he uses it in this way. I think he's talking about the leaders of the churches are in his, in his hand. See, he's got all the leaders of every church in his hand. He's walking among the churches. It's, it's a beautiful picture here uh, that Jesus is not some distant person not involved with his church. He is the one that is walking among the seven golden lampstands. He is showing John this picture. John is on the Isle of Patmos when he's giving this vision of God. And and he sees Jesus and he comes to him and he falls down as a dead man. And he says, get up, I've got something to say. And then he begins to give John this picture. And he begins in chapters 2 and 3 and he talks about the churches. And his message to the churches. And then in chapter 4 to the end of the book, he talks about what is going to happen. The future of things. You see, Jesus is intimately involved in our church. Sometimes we, we think that he's out there, he's somewhere else. But let me tell you, he has the leadership of the church. He has the individuals of the church. He knows us intimately. And he cares about our church. Which translate to he cares about us. He cares about us. Look, let's look first at the commendation, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, and then also verse 6. Let's talk about these condemnation, commendations. He's, he is bragging on the church. He begins to brag on the church at Ephesus here. I know your works. You know, Jesus knows our works as a church. He knows what we do on Sunday. He knows what we do on Monday. He knows every work of the church. He knows what we do uh, when we go to work. He knows what the church does when we are outside of the building. He knows what the church does in our families. He knows what the church does wherever we are, in our vacations, in our fun times. He knows everything about us at home. You see, Jesus knows. I know your works. Now, what are their works? Your labor, your endurance, that you cannot tolerate evil. Now, this labor and endurance here, he's, he, this is an idea that they have worked their fingers to the bone for Jesus. All right? This is an idea of they're just sweating and sweating. They are working hard for Jesus. They are enduring. They are going forward. I mean, they can't tolerate evil. They, are, they, are, they know the truth of God, and they are making sure that the lies about God are not told. They are making sure that they follow the truth of God. They are not tolerant of evil. You have tested those who have called themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. They test their teachers, the teachers of the word in their congregation. They test them and make sure that they're not false teachers, that they're not teaching something that's way out there, something that is apart from the truth of God. I mean, these people are diligent, right? They are hard workers. Verse 3, you also possess endurance. And have tolerated many things because of my name and have not grown weary. People have made fun of them because they're stand for Christ. Now, Ephesus is a, is a city that is uh, the cosmopolitan city of the day. It is the largest seaport in the area. It has all of the skyscrapers. It has all the trappings of all the modernity of the society of that time. Ephesus is a very wealthy City. It is also a very corrupt city because it has many temples of other, other gods in this city. The temple of Diana, the temple of Artemis, all of these temples. They were worshiping all of these other gods. And still, this church at Ephesus, they endured when people made fun of them. You only follow one god? I mean, that's ridiculous. I've got 17 at my house. You see, he's, he's making the, the point here that this church was an enduring church. It was a truthful church. It was a hard-working church. When it came to, to, to serving man, these people were after it. Then he says in verse 6, Yet... 
You do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Not only do they work hard and endure and, and they don't tolerate evil, but the, this, this sect had grown up, the Nicolaitans. These were, these were people that said they followed Christ, but they said that because Christ abolished the law, that you can live any way that you want to. You can go up to the temple of Diana and participate in ritual prostitution. You could go to the temple of Artemis and sacrifice your youngest daughter to maybe get some favor from the gods. You could do all of these things. You could live a, a sexually immoral life. You could, you could do all of these things and it doesn't matter because the flesh, what you do in the flesh is not as important as what you do in your mind and how you think. You see, that's the, the thoughts of the Nicolaitans. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Sounds a lot like the times in which we're living, doesn't it? You can, you can think one thing and you can live another way, but you're still okay because your body doesn't count. You see, he's commending them. He is telling them this is a picture of a great church, active in ministry, getting things done for Jesus. But wait. Hold your horses. With all these great things, I mean, uh, this kind of church here, I mean, it would be one that would be one of the biggest ones in the Southern Baptist Convention. It would be one of the greatest churches. The pastor, he would be on every podcast. He would be doing lectures all across the nation because the work of the church. I mean, the people, you know, they, they would be on television nationally. They would have all of this acclaim and, and acknowledgement because they are a church that gets after it. They know the truth. They do things. They are not letting moss grow on their backs. But does Jesus have the same opinion? The thing that we see here is not so much the commendation, but Jesus' condemnation. Verse 4. But I have this against you. Now let me just preface this. Anytime you see, but I have this against you, and Jesus is saying that, we must shake in our boots. Our flip-flops must rattle around on our feet. Because if Jesus says, I have something against you, it means something. It means something. Remember, he's talking to this great church. I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Some translations say you have abandoned your first love. You see, this is a very interesting twist because if you read the book of Ephesians, Paul, in the book of Ephesians, to this same church of which John is addressing now, Paul, he planted this church. He knew this church intimately. Twenty times in the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about the Ephesian church's love for Jesus. Twenty times he talks about how the Ephesian church loved Jesus. Jesus. And now we get to this point where Jesus comes himself to talk to John and he's saying, you have lost your first love. You've left him. That's quite a transition, don't you think? From a church that, that Paul said, I can obviously see you love Jesus to a church that Jesus himself says, you don't love me anymore. You see, the favorite hymn of this church is, Oh, how I loved Jesus. Because they were busy with activity. But they are no longer adoring the Savior. Oswald Chambers, in his devotion, says this. He says, Beware of anything that competes with the loyalty to Jesus Christ. He said, the greatest competitor of devotion to Jesus is service for him. You see, he's saying here that of all the things that they did, Christ was no longer first. This church from the outside was busy. It was active. It was doing things. It was trying to reach their community. But you see, they no longer loved Jesus. They loved their church. They loved their ministries, they loved their services, they loved their songs, they loved their beliefs. You see, they would fight 
for the truth of Christ, but they no longer loved Christ himself. Their adoration was replaced with activity. This is the epitome of what religion is. You see, religion is all of the trappings, the activities, the all of this stuff, so that I can be in the good graces of God. Every religion is like that except for Christianity. Right? And, 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 and I'll, in Islam, you have to do things in order to be in the favor of God. In, in, in Buddhism, you have to do things in order to, be to, to, to have favor. In, in Mormonism and in, in Judaism and all, all of these isms, you have to do something in order to have the favor of God. Christ says, you love me because you already got my favor. I showed you my favor on the cross. I shed my blood for you, not because you deserved it, but because of my great love for you. But yet, we love religion. We will, in in the lack of adoration, we will try to serve ourselves back to closeness with Jesus. Now, let me just say something here real quick. He is not saying that people serve Jesus don't love Jesus. He's saying this church did. And so all of those of you sitting here today that don't serve Jesus at all, okay, you need to be included in this too. He's not saying those that don't serve are more righteous than those that serve. He's not saying that at all. He's saying those of us who serve with the wrong motive, those of us who serve to maybe get the acclaim of people or to make ourselves feel better, those of us who serve, sing songs, go on mission trips, play instruments and all this to maybe soothe our soul. That's when it's wrong. Let me tell you, there is a reason that when Jesus was asked by the Pharisee, what are the two greatest commandments? And he says, the first and foremost one is to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we don't do that, we got nothing else. You can serve him all you want to. You can teach. You can play. You can sing. You can preach. You can play an instrument. You can sing. Whatever it is. If you don't do it with the love of Christ, you're doing it for yourself. And all that is is idolatry. All that is is idolatry. You are holding yourself up as an idol. You are saying, I am good because I do this. You ain't good at all apart from Christ. None of us are. You see, simply put, this this church, they were not having personal, intimate fellowship with Christ themselves. I mean, how do you get there? right? How do you get from a church that, that Paul had bragged on, that they loved Jesus? How do you get from there to hear where they had lost their first love. Well, let me tell you, it didn't happen all of a sudden. They didn't automatically have a meeting one day and said, hey, let's just do more stuff and let's just let's, let's talk less about Jesus. Remember, the church is composed of the people. Right? The church takes on the personality of the people. So what he's saying here is the church has lost its first love. He's saying the people of the church of Ephesus had lost their first love. They no longer held Jesus in their first position in their life. They put other things in the first position of their life. They're following ministries. They're following teachings. They, they might be more... Uh, uh, excited about the truth than they are about the one who gave us the truth. You see, he's telling us here that if we aren't careful, we will prioritize our lives out of Christ and his graces and his love and his intimacy. What do I mean by that? If you don't put Jesus first in your life, everything else that you put ahead of him will take over. If you don't take the time to open the Word of God repeatedly, 
If you don't take the time to individually spend intimate times of prayer with the Savior, you are prioritizing Jesus out of your life. We don't like to think that, though, do we? I mean, really, most of us say, you know, I'm all right. I'm all right. No, really, I'll get to it tomorrow. Before you know it, you haven't read the Word in weeks or months or years. Uh, you know, but I pray. I mean, I, I pray on the way to work. I, I pray during the day. You know, doesn't the Bible say that we're supposed to pray unceasingly? Well, yeah, he does. But let me ask you how well this would work out. You've got an intimate relationship, wife, husband, great friendship. And, and let's just put it this way. You, you talk to them on the cell phone all day, but you never sit down and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. How good a relationship would that be? It's stink. You always call them on the cell phone, but you never sit down with them face to face, knee to knee, and say, I love you. You see, if we don't set aside time for Christ in prayer, set aside time, I'm saying, time that you set at 30 minutes, 15 minutes, to spend with you and the Savior, the one who died for you and me. If you do not do that, you are prioritizing Jesus out of your life. No ifs, ands, or buts. You can't argue that point. If you try to argue it, you're trying to, to rationalize your sin. Oh, but I don't have time. Bull. We've all got the same 24 hours. It's just what you do with it that matters. Another thing is, is we let our passion grow cold. One of the most tragic things that I see often I'll go out to lunch or dinner here and we'll see a couple just saw this the other day I went to lunch with Mike Mahan we sat there at a table just inches away from another table a, a couple I assumed they were married they're both wearing rings but they sat there the whole time and they didn't say one word to each other not one word they talked more to the server than they did to one another. How sad is that? Well, you see, when we prioritize Christ out of our lives, we have lost our passion for Him. We say, I'm more passionate about my ball team. I'm more passionate about my hobby. I'm more passionate about this. I'm more passionate about that. If you can get up and yell when you catch a big fish... If you can get up and yell when your team scores, if we can beat our chests when those that we follow in our hobbies and we do something good, if we can do that but we can't do that with Jesus, we are idol worshipers. If you get more excited watching the Daytona 500 about your driver winning the race than you do about Jesus, let me tell you, your love has grown cold. Your passion is gone and you need to repent and come back to Christ. You see, Jesus gives us a great illustration. You can mark this in your Bible. You don't have to turn there. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 41. Jesus is coming through town, and he, and he, and he stops at Mary and Martha's house. Now, they believed in Mary and Martha. They believed in Jesus, and, and they, they believed that he was the Messiah. And, and so he gets there, and he, he's sitting down, and, and he's reclining at the table, or reclining there close to the table, and, and Mary is sitting there with him. And they're just talking. Meanwhile, Martha, I, I think she's the oldest, Martha is busy getting dinner ready for Jesus, setting the table, making sure that the wooden silverware she has is looking good, making sure that the, everything is spectacular. Well, as she's getting prepared for all this, she walks by several times. It's not a very big house, and she walks by and sees Mary sitting there with Jesus. And so what does a good oldest daughter say when she sees that? Jesus, won't you tell her to get her, uh, herself up and help me get ready for dinner? I mean, can't you see I'm doing all the work here? I mean, get up. 
Jesus, you tell her, you're the Savior. But she doesn't get the answer that she wants. Jesus, without hesitation, answered Martha. He said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. How many of us are the Martha? We're working our tails off to make ourselves look good for Jesus, and we're mad when somebody else didn't serve it. You see, it's a hard issue. Mary knew that she just wanted to be with Jesus. Martha said, I just want to make things right for Jesus. And Jesus made it very clear what is most important. Being with Jesus. I saw a story the other day. A man, 52 years old, had run all these marathons. He was a picture of health. He was running a marathon two weeks ago, and he died five miles before the finish line. They did the autopsy and they found out that this man, even though he had had all this exercise and all of this, he was dying on the inside and his heart exploded. But he thought he was so healthy because he exercised and had so much activity that he never checked the inside. Never went to the doctor because he didn't need to. And in the end, end it cost him his life. You see, you can do that. We can do that. We can have so much activity in our lives that we don't pause. And we don't let the Lord examine our heart. And before you know it, we become people that work a lot for the Lord, but we don't know the Lord anymore. Well, after the condemnation, we see the invitation that Jesus gives thee, come back to me, he says. Verse 5, he says, all of this may be true. He said, but remember first then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. He's saying here, he says, remember. Remember how you used to be when you first got saved. Remember that you always wanted to be at church. I remember when I first got saved, I got a Bible and I just couldn't put it down. I mean, the Spirit of God had invaded my heart. He had washed me clean of my sins. I I'd, I'd repented of, of everything I'd ever done. And I started reading the Word and I just couldn't put it down. I mean, it was like the words were just jumping off the page at me. It was just like the, the voice of God was reading it to me. It was so intimate and I was so passionate. But years later, I found myself having to struggle to take time to get in the Word. But you see, God tells us to remember. Remember what it was like. Remember when you were so passionate about Christ. Remember when you would just, you would just tell people around you about what Christ had done for you. R- remember when, when it was such a wonderful time and you would go to worship together with, with believers and you would just, the, the songs were just flowing from your heart. You, you, you teared up often because you remembered the sweetness of Jesus as he has saved you from your wretchedness. Ah, but then we get to the point of where we come and we just go through the motions We come because it's expected of us. But Jesus says, remember. Remember. Then he says also, repent. Remember what it used to be. And then repent of your sins. What he's saying here is, all of those things that have taken precedence over Christ, they may be good things. They may be your family. They may be decent things, you know, you're not, you're not going off. And, and the, the remarkable thing about this Ephesian church is they looked great on the outside. They looked holy and they looked righteous. They weren't in, caught in overt sin, right? These people went against those that were doing that. They were clean and righteous and holy on the outside. 
but they lacked Christ. Now, most of us here say, we're good. I don't need to really repent about anything. But if anything comes before your relationship with Christ, we must repent. Anything. Anything. Jesus says, just let it go. Let go of our hobbies. Let go of our families that we hold up instead of Christ. Let go of our ministries sometimes. Let go of the things that we are called to do. Let go of those things if they have a precedence over Christ. And repent. That word repent is not something... um, That is just a mind thing. You see, he starts out with remember, but the repentance is actual action. Jesus, I am doing this instead of you. I am turning around and I am going towards you. Repentance means action. If you spend more time on the television or on the internet, you need to repent and turn back to Christ. If you spend more time looking at your phone, than talking to your kids or your family or doing work, you need to repent. If your hobby gets more applause than Jesus, you need to repent. If you are more zealous for the country that we have to turn around than you are for Jesus himself, you need to repent. God is not joking here. I want you to see the very seriousness of this. Verse 5, he says, Otherwise, if you don't repent, he said, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Jesus is saying here, I don't care about all the stuff that you do. I care about you. And if you don't repent, I am going to remove myself from your church and you will no longer exist. I don't want that. I don't want a year from now, February uh, 22nd, around there, a year from now, a a Sunday from now, a year that, that we come and there's four people. Our favorite hymn is, I loved Jesus. You see, we have to repent, each one of us. Turn away from those things that take our focus off of Christ and to turn to Him. He says, not only repent, but He says, do the works you did at first. What's He saying here? He's calling us to the very basics of the faith again. You see, if you've got this, the Word of God in your hand, and you've got time to read and to pray, you've got everything you need initially. We've tried to make things so complex. I've got to have this kind of song sung, and I've got to do this, and I've got to get in the mood of worship and this and that. Just go to the Word of God. Open it. And spend time with your Savior. That's what Jesus is saying. Do the first things. Do the works that you did at first. Return to individual times of prayer. Don't let the prayer at the dinner table or your prayer before a meal. Or the prayer, God to help me before I take this test. God to help me because I'm in trouble at work. God do this. Take those times. Keep praying. But set set aside a time where you can sit with your Savior. Knee to knee. Heart to heart. And just worship Him. Be a Mary instead of a Martha. Return to coming to church. Committing yourself to being in the body of Christ. Commit yourself to small group Bible study. Where you can open the word with other brothers and sisters that are imperfect as you are. 
And you can talk about the word and the word can take over your heart. Return to obedience. You see, a lot of us don't want to read this book because it tells us the things that we need to do and we don't want to do it. We love our sin more than we do our Savior. Let's return to obedience to Christ. Let's return to humbling ourselves before the Lord and letting Him have control of our lives. Humbling ourselves. Lord, I am yours. What will you have me to do? Lord, my finances are yours. My family is yours. My work is yours. My health is yours. My hobbies are yours. My everything is yours. And we return to a humility where when we get on our knees to pray, Lord, we recognize that we have nothing to offer to the greatest King of kings and Lord of lords but ourselves. You see, that's what God wants from us. And that is not a subservient position. That is a period. That is a, a position to where that's where God begins to work in us. That's where he begins to renew that passion that we have lost. That's where he begins to renew that desire. When we throw those things away that we have put in place of Christ, he starts to renew us. He blows his breath of life into us. He says, return, do the works that you did at first. The seriousness, is, seriousness of this is, is intriguing. This church that looked great on the outside, but they're in as much trouble as a church can be. Read a story. In the ancient days, the king of Siam, which is now Thailand, he had understood that when he had an enemy that he wanted to torment and destroy, he would send the enemy a unique gift. He would send the enemy a, an elephant, a white baby albino elephant. Now, to the people of Siam, that elephant, especially the albino elephant, was an extremely rare thing. And what they did was they would have to take care of this baby elephant and they would have to tend to all of its needs and they would have to use all of their finances and emotions and, and over time the enemy would destroy himself because of the added burden of trying to care for this sweet gift given by a king that knew what he was doing. You see, our spiritual enemy has the same strategy. He wants to tempt you with little things that might be good at the time so that those will take you over and you will forget all about the Savior that paid everything for you. Are there any elephants in your life? Are there any things in your life right now that you need to let go? Is there anything now that you love more than you do Jesus? Well, let me tell you, anything in place of Jesus will only give you heartache and pain. It will only breed destruction. Because Christ is the only one that can give you peace and hope and true love. That only comes from God. You have to begin with Christ. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Christ, you've never repented of your sins and recognized that Jesus is the Savior, then today you have to start at the very beginning. That beginning of hum humility, saying, Christ, I have made a mess of my life. I have done it apart from you, and I need you. Forgive me of my sin. You are my Savior. You give your life to Christ. At that moment, there's a great transaction the price that was paid at the cross 
His blood shed for you that has automatically covered you. And the sins that you have committed, past, present, and future, are covered and paid for. You are forgiven forever. Maybe you're here today and you didn't intend to walk away from Jesus. That wasn't your desire. You didn't start out getting where you are today thinking, you know, today I'm just going to avoid Jesus a little more. But you have found yourself in a place now as a believer to where it's difficult to get in the Word and you haven't prayed by yourself on your knees and you don't know when. Jesus invites you back today. He says, remember. He says, repent. He says, do those things you did at first. I ask you as brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it? that we're feeding in our lives other than Christ. What is it? I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to have the time of invitation. It's a time where we do business with God. As he has spoken to us today, it is where we do the things that the Holy Spirit leads us to do. The invitation is not a time to look around and, and think about what's next. The invitation is a time to look to the Savior and say, God, what's next? It's a time where he given, he's giving us an opportunity to repent right here, right now. Just you, no one around you, just you. It is a time where the Lord will remind us what to do next.